Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm your host Sherry and you are listening to From the Dark Side podcast. Today we're talking about a young married couple from back in 1928 who set off on an adventure and didn't finish their trip. There has been a lot of rumors and speculation regarding Glenn and Bessie over the last 100 years. Did they fall in the water and drown? That would be the most obvious outcome for why they can't be located. But some things come out that make you wonder if something else happened to them instead. This case was featured on the very first episode of Unsolved Mysteries with Robert Stack. It premiered on November 29th, 1987. My sources are in the description area. This is episode 128, The Case of Glenn and Bessie Hyde. This story takes us back to 1928. That's almost 100 years ago. 1928 was a big year. Steamboat Willie, the first Mickey Mouse cartoon, was released. Sliced bread was available for the first time and is considered the greatest innovation in baking. Penicillin was discovered while a Scottish bacteriologist was studying influenza. Amelia Earhart flew across the Atlantic Ocean. A man named John Baird demonstrated the transmission of color TV for the first time. Bubblegum was invented. And in weird news from 1928, an Italian monk named Pellegrino Ernetti claimed that he had a time-traveling viewer. He said you could look in his device called a chronovisor and view the crucifixion of Jesus and ancient Rome. Some folks who get married travel afar for their honeymoon. They go to resort towns or out of the country to relax and get away before beginning their new life together as husband and wife. But for newly married couple Glenn and Bessie Hyde, there will be zero relaxing on their honeymoon. They chose to boat across the Grand Canyon. The Colorado River runs under the Grand Canyon, and they wanted to not only go the entire distance, they wanted to set a speed record. Plus, Bessie would be the first woman to accomplish this task. This would be a record-breaking feat for her. Glenn and Bessie are from Twin Falls, Idaho. They had met two years prior while on a passenger ship traveling from San Francisco to Los Angeles. They hit it off, but it was complicated because Bessie was already married to another man. They were separated at the time. Bessie claimed the two had only lived together as husband and wife for two months before separating. Bessie moved to San Francisco to study art and poetry at the California School of Fine Arts. Bessie wants to marry Glenn, but her ex is like, nah, I'm not agreeing to a divorce. So Bessie moved to Nevada since the divorce laws were really lenient there. Once she lived there for a couple months, she met the residency requirements and was finally able to divorce him. When Glenn and Bessie got married, it was one day after her divorce was finalized. Glenn is 29 years old and Bessie is 22 years old. They are an interesting pair and very opposite. Bessie is only five foot tall and she's 90 pounds, so she's super tiny. In the photos I've seen of the couple, the first thing I noticed was how modern they both look. They don't look like they're in 1928. They look more like the 1990s. Glenn works on a farm in Idaho. Bessie enjoys reading and poetry and the arts. She's not crazy about this trip across the Grand Canyon, but she decides to go anyway. Glenn is hyping her up, telling her that once she completes it, she'll be the first woman to accomplish this, but she's not feeling it. This is during a time period when people were breaking records and becoming super famous for it. Look at Amelia Earhart. But Bessie is not a river kind of person. She wants to sit in the boat and read books and relax while Glenn does all the work. She's super reluctant to go, but she agrees anyway. So the Colorado River is 1,400 miles long. 277 miles of this river is through the Grand Canyon. This is going to be their honeymoon. Glenn built a 20-foot wooden scow for them to take the trip on. A scow is basically a sailboat without the sail. It has a flat bottom and it's able to hold cargo inside. Glenn is an experienced boater. He crossed two rivers in Idaho, but the Colorado River is a whole different monster and he has a passenger now and he's trying to set a speed record. 
On October 20th, 1928, they set off on their whitewater rafting trip and down the river they go. The plan is to travel the Green River in Utah, then hundreds of miles through the rapids of the Colorado River before finally arriving in Needles, California. They ran into a more experienced rafter who described Glenn's boat as unsafe and basically a wooden coffin. He noticed Glenn and Bessie didn't have life jackets. Glenn, for some reason, didn't bring any. Some will say the reason for this is that life jackets in 1928 were hard to come by. You couldn't just run out to Walmart or Dick's Sporting Goods and buy them. It was a process to get a life jacket. Also, Glenn said the extra weight on the boat would just weigh it down. Regardless, they finished the first leg of their trip and made it to the Grand Canyon National Park in record time. On November 15th, they made it to Phantom Ranch. They docked their boat and started hiking a trail up up to the home of a man named Emery Kolb. Emery and his brother Ellsworth were local celebrities, I guess you could call them. If you were going down the Colorado River at the Grand Canyon, you pop in and see Emery. He's a photographer and will take your picture and give you coffee and whatever you need. They want to stop in and see Emery since Emery is very knowledgeable about the Colorado River and he could give them advice and tell them what points to avoid. His house is also a photography studio and he could get really shots, really good shots of the Grand Canyon because it overlooks it. It still exists today. In fact, it was restored by Grand Canyon historians in 2013. Emery took a few photos of Glenn and Bessie. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see a picture of the couple Emery took on the screen. I gotta say, Bessie looks amazing for being on a river for the last month. I would be a hot mess. Emery noticed that Bessie seemed not very thrilled about the trip. He got the vibe that Bessie felt unsafe and she just wants it to be over. Emery offered life jackets to the couple, but Glenn declined. Bessie seems very nervous as they're beginning to leave. She saw Emery's young daughter and made a comment about her shoes. She says, I wonder if I'll ever get to wear pretty shoes again. Bessie and Glenn say their goodbyes and get back into the boat. They set back off on their adventure. On November 16th, this is the day after leaving Emery's house, Historians have said that Glenn and Bessie ran into a wealthy man named Adolph Sutro. He was at the Grand Canyon and rode with them a short distance on their trip. I can see Bessie being like, hello, yes, this is our honeymoon. He took a photo of Glenn and Bessie on their boat. This photo exists, so it's likely this man really did accompany them for a short while. Adolph was said to be the last person to see them alive. After they dropped him off, he hiked back to where he was before. Adolph later told others that Glenn's boat was the most inadequate equipped outfit he'd ever seen. It's strange to me that he would say that since he volunteered to ride for miles in it. They know the next 15 miles are going to be rough. Emery had warned them about this particular stretch. There's rocks everywhere and it's pretty dangerous. But once they get through these 15 miles, the water will turn much calmer. So by early December, no one has seen or heard from Glenn and Bessie. Emery begins a search of the river. He even hires a plane to fly around to try to locate them. This plane flies through the inner gorge of the Grand Canyon, which is probably a really cool thing to see in person. Glenn and Bessie's family is informed that they are missing. So Glenn's dad hires his own search party. They search around the Grand Canyon and the river and they see no sign of Glenn and Bessie anywhere. Glenn's father reaches out to the governor of Idaho and the governor of West Virginia, which are Glenn and Bessie's home states. He begs them to do something to help find these two. Eventually, word gets all the way up to President Calvin Coolidge. He authorizes army planes to perform aerial searches of the Grand Canyon. And on December 19th, one of the planes does end up locating their boat. It was snagged on some rocks and resting. It was tied to something on the shore. The water was calm and it was just kind of sitting there empty. The rescuers arrive at the boat and don't see Glenn or Bessie anywhere. The boat is fully intact and operable. They see all the supplies are neatly packed on the boat, their clothes, their food, Bessie's journal, even Glenn's rifle was there. 
A camera was found, and when the film was developed, it showed the last photo was taken on November 27th at mile marker 165. Bessie kept a journal documenting the trip, and her last entry was November 30th, which was days after Adolf departed from the boat. This is also 15 days after they left Emery, the photographer's house. The last location Bessie mentioned in her journal was Diamond Creek. When Diamond Creek was searched, they found an old shack and carved onto the ceiling beam read, Glenn and Bessie Hyde, November 31st, 1928. They probably meant December 1st, since there's only 30 days in November. By all accounts, Glenn and Bessie were beating their estimated time of arrival in Needles, California. They would have 100% set the speed record. Bessie would have had the honor of being the first woman to make the trip. Did they abandon the boat and begin hiking the Grand Canyon instead and died from the elements? If they did this, Bessie likely would have written in her journal that they were going to abandon the boat and head out for one of the trails. Also, the woods were searched and there wasn't any evidence that they had been living in there. What the heck happened? The boat is tied with a rope, so it appeared that they did this intentionally with hopes of returning to it. Emery and his team cut the rope and piloted the boat out of the water. This action would later be criticized by many folks, since if Glenn and Bessie had plans to return to their boat, it's gone now. But Emery's theory is that they fell out of the boat and are now in the water somewhere. He doesn't believe they made it out alive. Rumors are flying around. Did Glenn get tired of his wife's complaining about the trip and decide to get rid of her? Did a vagrant murder them? If so, the person didn't take any of their food or supplies. The most likely theory is that they hit rough waters and fell overboard and drowned, although their bodies have never been located. Or they left the boat and began walking and got lost in the woods. But they were so close to finishing the trip, they were beating their estimated time to finish. They were close to breaking the record. Why give up now? Why wouldn't Glenn take his rifle if they're going to be out scavenging in the woods? Why leave all their food? There's a lot of questions people have, and no one knows the answers. Glenn's dad even spent four days walking the shore from the last campground to where the boat was found, but he doesn't see any signs of the couple. There was a body of a man in his 20s that was found, but it was determined not to be Glenn. The man died of starvation and the elements after getting lost in the mountains, but this shows how thoroughly everyone was searching. There's going to be so many more theories over the next 100 years of what happened to Glenn and Bessie Hyde, starting in 1971, 43 years after their disappearance. In October 1971, there is a group of folks taking a three-week Grand Canyon adventure. They are being led by a guide named Rick. He organizes these hikes through the Grand Canyon. The group ends their hike at the end of the day, and they're all sitting around a campfire. Rick points down to the water and tells the, tells the group that that is where a couple on their honeymoon disappeared. He tells them way back in 1928, Glenn and Bessie Hyde disappeared and no one has been able to locate them ever since. Everyone's like, ooh, tell us more. An elderly woman in the group who is a psychology professor speaks up and says, I know this story. I'm Bessie Hyde. The other guide on the trip, who is a geologist named George, looks at her and says, what? She says, I'm Bessie Hyde. She stares into the fire as she tells the story. She said her and Glenn were on their honeymoon. She said Glenn was so abusive and he was so determined to finish this stupid trip that she didn't even want to go on. So she stabbed him and dumped him in the water after they had a big fight. She tied the boat up and began hiking. She made it out to Peach Springs, where she caught a Greyhound bus. She began a new life elsewhere. Everyone is sitting there around the campfire, just shocked. You were almost finished your trip, they tell her. But she says she was tired of Glenn and didn't want to spend another minute in that boat. After the hiking group completed their trek through the Grand Canyon, word gets back to town that Bessie Hyde may have been located. Of course, the first people who want to talk to her are the police. This woman goes by Elizabeth Cutler, and she is around the same age that Bessie would be in 1971. 
Elizabeth denied that she was Bessie Hyde. She says, I don't know what these people are talking about. Even though there's 10 plus people who witnessed her telling this story, she denies ever telling it. Elizabeth's background was checked into, and her younger years were well documented. There were photos uncovered of her in 1928, and she didn't look anything like Bessie. But the most obvious thing was that Elizabeth was five foot four inches tall. Bessie was only five foot. Elizabeth, the psychology professor, was known to play with people's minds by giving them examples and scenarios and what ifs. This was a collective way to work a whole group of people at one time. Elizabeth died in 1998 at the age of 90. The next development took place in December of 1976. This is 48 years after Glenn and Bessie disappeared. Emery Kolb, who owns the famous photography studio at the Grand Canyon, the man who took the photo of Glenn and Bessie, the man who organized a search of the river, He passed away, and while going through his items, some folks went into his boathouse where they saw a very old canoe hanging from the rafters. Inside the canoe was a male skeleton. This skeleton was passed to the medical examiner's office who determined that it belonged to a Caucasian man in his 20s who had died from a gunshot wound. A bullet from a 32 caliber gun was found embedded in his skull Forensics showed the bullet came from a gun from 1902, so this is a very old piece of evidence. Plus, the clothes that were, that were with the skeleton were linked to the 1920s, which was the same time Glenn and Bessie disappeared. Is it possible that this skeleton belonged to Glenn? Is it possible that Emery felt sorry for Bessie and killed Glenn so she could escape? Emery listened to Bessie complain about how dangerous the waters were and told them she wasn't having any fun. But Emery was a well-respected photographer, and no one believed he would have done something like this. He's not a shady guy. He sees people in all different walks of life at the canyon all the time. He feeds them and sends them on their way. On the show Unsolved Mysteries in 1987, when this case was featured, the show consulted with a forensic anthropologist named Dr. Walter Birkby. He earned the nickname Dr. Death because he is able to identify human remains before the time of DNA testing. Basically, if you have unidentified remains nowadays, you go through a DNA process. It's much easier. Back then, you sent the remains to Dr. Birkby, who can help determine who they are. He was able to determine through facial structure that this man was not Glenn Hyde. He definitely died 50 plus years ago, but it's not Glenn. So who was this man, and why is he in a canoe in Glenn's boathouse for the last 50 years? The cold case squad of the Coconino County Sheriff's Office investigated and found the remains were linked to an unidentified John Doe who disappeared in the Grand Canyon of June 1933. The body was found with a bullet hole in his head. A 32 caliber gun had been found next to his body. Photographs were taken of the victim when he was found, and he had the same clothes on that were in the canoe in Emery's boathouse. So Emery had been a representative on the county coroner's jury. Since no one claimed this man's remains, Emery took them home and stored them in his boathouse. Can you imagine today in 2024 how that would go over? Anyway, Emery should have told someone in his family about the remains. Instead, after he passed, a whole investigation had to take place to figure out if these were Glenn's remains or not. It could have saved saved a lot of time and money. I wonder why Glenn didn't bury the skeleton, and the only reason I can come up with was that he was keeping them in case the man's family ever came forward. Still, to this day, I can't find if this person was ever identified. It appeared that he was a man in his 20s who got lost out in the mountains and was beginning to starve to death or succumb to the elements, so he decided to take his own life and go out on his own terms before that could happen. Perhaps the strangest part of this case to me is regarding a woman named Georgie Clark. Georgie died of cancer in 1992 at the age of 81. Georgie is a former river guide in the Grand Canyon where she worked for 45 years. In an area dominated by men, she stood out. She could get you anywhere you needed to go on the river. She was known to boat the full length of the Grand Canyon. 
Georgie was quite a badass who even got an area of the Colorado River named Georgie's Rapid. Folks would say you would see Georgie racing down the river, often wearing a leopard print bikini with a beer in her hand all the time. She took her last trip down the Colorado River in 1991 when she was 80 years old. This was just one year before she died from cancer. As a side note, I found it so sad that Georgie had a daughter who died at age 15 after a bicycle accident. Georgie found comfort in the river and was a completely different person after her daughter's death, as most of us are. There are so many articles I found about Georgie and her adventure. She was quite a character. After her death in 1992, her caretaker was going through some personal items of hers and found hidden away in a drawer was a pistol and Glenn and Bessie Hyde's marriage certificate. This started rumors that Georgie was actually Bessie and had been living a life in disguise this whole time. They also learned that Georgie's real name is Bessie de Rossa. She was born in 1911. At the time of Bessie and Glenn's disappearance, Georgie would have been 18. Bessie was 22. This was found not to be true that Bessie and Georgie were the same person, just like they did with Elizabeth in 1971. Photos were looked at, and Georgie didn't look anything like Bessie. She was also five inches taller than Bessie. But why did she have their marriage certificate? Someone recalled a time when Georgie was asked about Emery, and she said she never liked him. Friends say that Georgie would know what kind of rumors she would stir up by having this marriage certificate in her drawer, and she thought it would give people a good laugh after her death. So yeah, it's weird that she had this marriage certificate and her real name is Bessie on her birth certificate, but authorities didn't pursue any more of the investigation. Let's go through the theories of what could have possibly happened to Glenn and Bessie. One theory is that Glenn killed Bessie and then fled. He got tired of listening to her continually asked how much further, and he killed her. Or Bessie killed Glenn and went away to start over. Keep in mind, there is no evidence that either was abusive. In fact, all accounts show that they were very much in love and had a good relationship. The obvious theory is drowning. There was a river guide named Bert Loper who disappeared around the same area in 1949. He was heading down the Colorado River and came out of his boat and drowned. It took 26 years for his skeleton to be found. It was 50 miles from where his boat capsized, so it's totally possible to fall in this water, drown, and not be located for decades. Most historians and river experts believe Glenn and Bessie drowned that day. Their boat was found tied up, though. Someone who was alive would have had to tie the boat up. So did they park the boat and then get out and swim? That would be a super foolish thing to, for them to do in that area. A historian named Otis Marston believes that they died in a crash at mile marker 232. Mile marker 232 is a dangerous area of the river, Guides say it looks like a pot of rapidly boiling water. It's completely white. It's even been renamed the Honeymoon Rapid after Glenn and Bessie. If they perished at that dangerous area, that would mean someone found the boat and tied it up. Also, the boat was not harmed. There wasn't any evidence of a crash. Again, all their clothes and food and Bessie's journal were still neatly sitting in the boat. Otis interviewed a park ranger who had ran into Glenn and Bessie during the trip. The park ranger told him the little woman was sick of it, but Glenn insisted that they finish the trip. This is such an intriguing mystery, and it's been almost 100 years, and we still don't know what happened to Glenn and Bessie that day. Anyone who was around at that time is no longer alive today, so it's possible we may never know what happened to them. On the Unsolved Mysteries show back in 1987, I watched it yesterday to refresh my memory of this case. I noticed they spared no expense in recreating the scene, like they sent the actors to the rushing white waters in the Grand Canyon and had them portray Glenn and Bessie. If a movie was based on them, I could see that, but just for a 10-minute clip on a weekly TV show, it's wild that they went all out for it. Many times they just recreated on a much smaller scale. It's safe to say that if you ever find yourself on the Colorado River, make sure you bring life jackets and listen to the guides and don't bring anyone who doesn't want to be there. Your intuition is always right. Remember Bessie telling Emery's young daughter, 
I wonder if I'll ever wear pretty shoes again. Rest in peace to Glenn and Bessie Hyde, who if alive today would be well over 100 years old in 2024. That's it for this week, and I'll see you all again soon. Take care, and much love to you all.